opportunity to um, put, consolidate, uh, put together those four groups that ask them their questions. And, and that's what I mean by eliminate resistance. And what happens would be um, so the, the moderator, when they um, announce a certain question, will um, group one, um, this question, there was four questions from four other groups. We'll ask group one to ask this question on behalf of them. And so this helps um, us understand that this question was a popular question among all the participants. And, and then just one group will ask this question. And this way we're able to get through as many questions as possible because generally we ask the group to submit two questions. And those two questions would then Oftentimes we have maybe 15 to 20 groups. It gets to be uh, quite a bit of questions, so we have to be very, very careful um, with this time. Again, we do our best to make sure that each group gets to ask at least one of their questions because um, uh, uh, the group spends so much time putting together these questions that we want to respect. The time and, and make sure that they don't feel like they've wasted their time developing the question. So, right, that covers the small group discussion and also the plenary session. Um, I know that was uh, a little, uh, quite a bit of information for just a, an early morning. So, I, I want to just double check uh, to just five. So a couple minutes to see if there are any questions related to the small group discussion, the plenary session, um, any any questions about um, the reasoning behind it, any logistical questions before I move on to um, grouping material, which is um, a very important part of, of our process. So any questions? From uh, the discussions on this small group, I also able to consider their uh, viewpoints. The assumption is they are experts, but many times experts are also mistaken. So from these questions coming from the small group, are there moments when experts can also you know, shift their viewpoints so that they are also informed by the questions coming? Yes, well, the experts learn a lot from the questions, but because we have competing experts, they learn from each other and correct each other. But often what happens is instead of learning from each other, they show the other side, which uh, if you're an expert with a particular viewpoint, you may emphasize one side and neglect another side. For example, when we had the, um, the energy policy deliberative polls in Texas, the um, the advocate of coal would say, you should get your electricity from coal. It's very cheap, uh, and the cost is very stable, uh, and clean coal is much cleaner than dirty coal used to be. Well, then the, uh, the next expert was the natural gas expert, and he said, clean coal may be cleaner than, it, than dirty coal, but natural gas is much cleaner. The coal guy didn't want to say that. Natural gas is much cleaner, and natural gas is also cheap. Um, then the wind guy would say, well, wind is a lot cheaper. I mean, it's a lot cleaner than natural gas, um, and much better for the environment. But, uh, and then the coal guy would say, but the wind doesn't blow all the time. So, so you see, they would correct each other. And actually, what each person said was true, but it was only a partial truth. It was the partial truth that, from that perspective, was most important. But in order for the people to deliberate, they needed to have the whole picture. They needed to know the merits of coal, but the limitations of coal. The merits of natural gas, but the limitations of natural gas. The mer Oh, and then the conservation guy would say, the cleanest thing of all for the environment is to conserve and cut back the need. Then you don't need to, uh, you, you have uh, demand-side management.